John Medved, great to be with you, founder of Our Crowd, and here we're in your offices. Uh, first of all, tell us the latest about Our Crowd. We're um, today Israel's most active venture capital investor. We've been that way for almost a decade. We are a platform that allows, at the moment, almost 220,000 investors from around the world to connect with startups that make potentially great investment opportunities. And these startups can be in a variety of fields like cybersecurity or food technology, the cloud, space technology, next generation mobility or energy. And you can actually discover these opportunities on the web or via your mobile phone and not only get it educated about that area and about the company's unique value proposition, but you can actually put money to work. And it's sort of a, a way for the rest of us to get into one of the most lucrative areas of finance, which has been venture capital, mm -hmm. which has typically been pretty much a closed club, where unless you had gazillions of dollars, mm -hmm. you couldn't play the game. But now, we're making this available to what are called accredited investors. In America, you have to have a million dollars of assets, mm -hmm. according to SEC regulations. But if you have that million dollars, and they say that, would you believe 21 million American households have that, okay, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. what a wonderful story in terms of the success of America, then these investors and others around the world can look at our, our companies. And the majority of our companies are companies that come from Israel that uh, is the startup nation, if you will, mm -hmm. where there's so much innovation and so much reflection of you know God's promise to bring good news from this holy land. And mm -hmm. uh, we're allowing people to play a role in terms of supporting it, hopefully profiting from it, and getting involved in terms of solving some of the, the biggest problems in the world. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about that good news coming from uh, God's holy land? Well, how does that <laughs> <laughs> look i think that i've been blessed to live in israel for mm -hmm. over 40 years um i got here as a kid and uh i've when i got here there were about two million people living here today there are 10 million people when i got here there wasn't a single venture capital fund today there are hundreds of them when i got here we weren't known as the startup nation and today the fame of israel in terms of building these companies you know is, is is worldwide and people are flocking here not just for the holy sites and to have a spiritual experience and to enjoy our delicious food and to frolic on our beautiful beaches and experience our nightlife but people are are are, are coming because they sense that israel has got some secret sauce which i i think it relates to our history as sort of being visionaries, dreamers, all the way back to Abraham, mm -hmm. our father, but that is now addressing huge issues that we all have to get behind. And whether it's new kinds of energy that won't hurt the planet, or new kinds of food production so we can feed the world, or new kinds of medicine so we can heal the world, Israel is really on the forefront of so much of this technology development. It has become the biggest business in the country as, as a group which is the tech business, and it's our largest source of exports. And we're frankly, after Silicon Valley, we're probably the second most uh, dynamic and impactful uh, tech ecosystem in the world. Probably few people are like you who see all these new technologies. Based on what you've seen of these new startup companies and technology, we're on the cusp of, I guess, breakthroughs in different areas. What do you see coming in the future? Look, I, I think that some of these things are so unbelievable. We're investing in a company called H2 Pro, who are working on what's called green hydrogen, literally to make the fuel of the future. Everyone's excited about hydrogen, but in a very efficient, clean way and at a low cost. They're talking about providing hydrogen at a dollar a kilogram, you know, in, in a matter of, you know, just a couple of years. We're invested in a company called blue-green water technologies, who just now announced that they've cleaned up yet another lake in America's southeast. They're fighting the pandemic that we don't know as much about like COVID. It's called mm -hmm. toxic algal blooms, which are these horrible sort of scum that form on lakes and rivers, kill aquatic life, make the water undrinkable, 
make it even hazardous to go and enjoy in the summer your beautiful swim. And this Israeli company has now figured out a safe and effective and EPA approved mm -hmm. methodology of literally in a day making it all go poof, it's mm -hmm. gone. Okay, and they are doing it now in Florida, South Carolina, other places, and hopefully in a, a lake or river soon by you. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a, a company called Consumer Physics who are using the most advanced optical technology to build a tiny spectrometer, which essentially is a, uh, usually a big desktop machine, mm -hmm. which lets you Google matter. It tells you how much sugar or protein or moisture are in objects. Mm -hmm. And this is critical data for today's farmers who can now not just send corn or wheat or barley or soybeans into a lab for analysis, but they can hold this little device the size of a key fob or it's built in to a cup and it's even now being built into a combine which they can now get this real-time agricultural data which totally changes their business mm -hmm. and so whether it's in healthcare where we have a company called MIGVAX who are pioneering oral vaccines for COVID and for other things where you'll be able to take a pill. It doesn't need to be stored in freezing temperatures. It's cheap. It can be distributed around the world equitably so everybody can be protected. And it's in healthcare, it's in ag, it's in cleaning up water, it's in next forms of energy. And, and, and just as a sample, look, we have a, a pretty large group of companies here, 350 portfolio companies, you can see some mm -hmm. of the, you know, this, uh, what we call tombstones, even though they, they, they're not, no one died. These are companies that exited uh -huh. uh, because they were bought or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, went public, you know, in uh, usually, you know, NASDAQ or the New York Stock mm -hmm. Exchange. But it, it's just, it's one of these jobs that you love to come to work in the morning because I can, I can sympathize with people who sometimes get upset with the news. Right, you read about, or you experience, God forbid, uh, the nightmare that's going on in people's airports today. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just flew back in, yeah, yeah. and and it's it's not pleasant to wait for hours or to have your plane canceled. You don't have to complain about it. You can invest in a solution that solves the problem. We have a company called Intellect, which is now on our platform, which they're using artificial intelligence and the existing CCTV. Uh, camera feeds at airports to improve what's called turnaround time. How much time does a plane have to stay on the ground? Because the issue today with the airports, not enough planes, not enough pilots, mm -hmm. therefore you get delayed or God forbid canceled. I okay, the that's, that's the worst kind of cancel culture. It's yeah. like having your plane canceled. But we don't have to sit there and just take it. Okay, mm -hmm. you, you can say, wait a minute. Okay, so this is a problem. This is gonna be a growing market. I wanna invest in a company that's improving this. We have another company called Seatru, uh, which is essentially giving aid to the TSA and other security organizations to help them get people through that passenger security line much, much faster because they're using artificial intelligence to understand what's inside the baggage. Mm -hmm. And so there are, not that there's technology solutions for everything, there isn't, okay? And, and, and by all means, people have to understand that technology is a tool and it can be used for good or it can be used, God yeah. forbid, for evil, okay? And we've gotta maintain moral standards and you know, spiritual guidance, if you will, to make sure that we're you know, really solving problems and not creating new ones, okay? There's a lot of fear around yeah. artificial intelligence and, and robots that will take over, whether it's, you know, the sort of dystopian visions of the matrix and others, but we're talking about challenges that are just so obvious and important, okay? And whether it's improving yield for farms, because today mm -hmm. people are going hungry more than ever before because of this food crisis, which has been, wasn't started with the war uh, between Russia and the Ukraine and the invasion, but it's, it's now got terribly exacerbated. Yeah, right. And in our region, in the Middle East, there are millions, tens of millions of people who are getting hungrier and hungrier. And I can't personally bear 
to sit back and, and just pray or just uh, think about it. Okay, I want to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a portion of the Bible uh, where Moses is sitting on the Red Sea and the people of Israel are, are crying to him saying, why did you take us out of Egypt? Weren't there enough graves in Egypt? By the way, I always use that as a proof of the existence of God because Jewish humor that we know today was in the Bible <laughs> back at, the, at that time. But the bottom line is that he's sitting there saying, what do I do? And, and God says, do something, open up the waters, get in there. We, we learn in our tradition that it was Nachshon ben Aminadab, the prince of the tribe of Judah, who went up to his neck into the water, and that's when the waters split. Mm. That you have to act. It's not just to be, you know, mindful and, pr and, and prayer, which has huge power, sure. okay, which we agree, but there are things that can be done, okay, and that means creating new technology mm -hmm. solutions, getting out into the field and helping people get eye care and, you know, providing clean water to villages. All of these are parts of the global needs that we have. But what I, what I love about living here in this little country, and we talked about the good news, mm -hmm. is that we're 10 million people. You know, that's it. We're, we're, we're a tiny speck in terms of the, you know, uh, 7 billion plus people on this planet. And yet, we take that responsibility seriously. We have a long history and a bright future, and we want to lead. Yeah. We want to help people address and engage with these issues and as best we can. We're not, you know, uh, arrogant about it or, you know, think that we have all the answers. We want to work together with other scientists and entrepreneurs and business people around the world. And what we're doing in our crowd is helping them connect to some of the best and the brightest minds here in Israel and elsewhere around the world where they can tackle this. And since we've got a community now of 220,000 people, almost, around the world, okay, who are connecting, investing, we're managing almost $2 billion of assets, which we've gathered mm -hmm. from this group, and directing it to these companies, hopefully making a return. And so far, the uh, results have been good, although past performance is no indication <laughs> of future performance, which my lawyers tell me always to say, you know, if you're being interviewed. But the reality is that we are, we're in the fight mm -hmm. and we're giving it the, the, the best we can. And this little, you know, uh, this little spunky country, okay, is really out there, I think, punching out of its weight class mm -hmm. in terms of addressing global issues. So all this technology is, is it what the Bible says? Israel will be a light to the nations? Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, um, I think that even there are many, you know, Israelis come in all kinds of colors and, you know, flavors and religious orientations and religions. I mean, you know, Israel is a, a, a real microcosm of the world. Mm -hmm. But I think most of us, no matter what politics or culture or country of origin we come from have this sense that there is destiny afoot, that we hear history here, that we experience our, our, our rich past. We don't forget about it, but we're not only just living in it and you know looking backwards, we're looking forwards. And it's that ability to be sort of in that fertile middle ground you know, mm -hmm. living between past and future, very much in today, and trying to figure out how I'm going to play a positive role. And as I get older in my years, I, don't, I hope I'm not older in my mind or in my, my spirit, I feel a, a compulsion, which we were talking about before, to act more. Because I, you know, mm. time mm -hmm. is, is the, yeah. the, the, the only limited resource we have. I believe that, you know, um, I believe that we can build a bigger pie for everybody. Mm -hmm. I think that we can continue to grow. I'm not an anti-growth person, but my role is going to be, you know, of a finite period here on, on, the, on this earth. Mm -hmm. But what I can do is I can leave something after I go as a legacy 
I can bring up children who share my values, who create their own path and their own way to contribute and, uh, and God willing, you know, grandchildren. And I have a bunch of those. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we say in our, in our tradition that the greatest blessing is Uri Banim Libanecha, where you basically, you see your children's children, mm. because that's how you get close to immortality. When you see that your children are following in your footsteps and are not just that, but then training their mm -hmm. kids, the next generation, then you as a, a parent and then a grandparent, I think, get a very special kind of joy, which we have a, a word for it, nachat or naches in Yiddish, which is that joy that a parent gets from their children and their mm -hmm. grandchildren. That's a blessing that we wish people yeah. at their, their weddings, mm -hmm. at their circumcisions, at their bar mitzvah, that you should always be blessed yeah. in that way. Yeah. Just coming from the States and seeing my children or grandchildren, I, I share some of that, but that's a great way of looking at it. Because you're right, we have a limited amount of time, and we want to make the most of it and leave a legacy. Um, you know, you talked about good news coming out of this land, but there is news here in the region. Uh, President Joe Biden will be visiting Israel and Saudi Arabia. What are your expectations uh, for his trip? Well, look, I, I think that the really good news recently in this part of the world has been the Abraham Accords, which was so smartly named, because what it has resulted in is this incredible release of energy between the children of Abraham, okay, who today share this region mm -hmm. and are now increasingly working together rather than being in conflict, but at now working together as partners. And this partnership that we've established with the first four countries who joined those Abraham Accords, you know, the UAE, Bahrain, uh, Morocco, Sudan, is just the beginning. And as you, as you mentioned, President Biden is now coming. Mm -hmm. uh, he's going to be visiting both Israel and uh, Saudi Arabia, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And we're hopeful that this, this will lead to further progress in terms mm -hmm. of bringing the region together. Because there is so much which we have in common, again, whether it's a religious or spiritual outlook, you know, a belief in God, uh, all the way to uh, a, 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 an embrace of technology. Mm -hmm. Our, our neighbors in the, uh, in the Gulf region, and whether it's the, the Emiratis or the Saudis, they are very, very determined to uh, modernize and to build on technology and fast. And they're significant investors in our kinds of businesses, uh, such as you know, venture capital and technology. They're obviously a, a traditional energy powerhouse, but they're now working mm -hmm. on renewables and investing heavily in that. They're very interested in food technology because of the issues of food security in the area. They're very concerned about water supplies and how in this arid region mm -hmm. we can you know, survive even despite the climate issues. But it goes way beyond these obvious areas into smart cities. You go and visit some of the cities in the Gulf. You know, uh, Neom uh, is one. Uh, yeah, 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 the planned city of Neom mm -hmm. is really way out ahead mm -hmm. of many people in the world in terms of at least the vision and soon the execution in terms of how to create new living spaces. When you look at what's going on today in, in Abu Dhabi or Dubai or Riyadh, these are very interesting cities that are you know, being built out of the desert. When you look at what's going on with mobility in terms of new kinds of transportation they're investing, logistics, the ports in Dubai are, have no, you know, comparison almost anywhere in the world. When you look at what's going on in airlines, right? Some of these airlines, whether it's Etihad and Abu Dhabi or the Emirates, and, and these are fun. It, it, people don't, I think, appreciate that this, it's not just Israel, which is a technology powerhouse, but it's going to ultimately become the region. And when this sand curtain, which separated us from our neighbors, sort of dissipates, and mm -hmm. I just recently published a opinion piece in my, uh, uh, my own blog on LinkedIn, which I mm -hmm. you know, welcome your readers to you know, uh, uh, subscribe to. When this f comes down, starts to come down, there's no, it's not coming back up. If you ever worked with sand, it, 
the, the beach with your grandkids, okay? You know, it's, it's pretty hard to keep it mm -hmm. from coming down and it stays down. And that's what's happening now, is that barrier is being brought down never to come back. And the fact that, you know, this has happened already for the last year and a half with uh, uh, the UAE and others, and now, you know, seems to be including a much broader circle, including people like the Saudis, this is a huge blessing. It's going to unlock tremendous energy. It's going to be phenomenal for business. There's going to be investment pouring into this region. Mm -hmm. And it's going to have an impact where the world will look to the Middle East and not say, oh, you know, those poor guys, they can't get their act together. But they're going to say, wow, that really is where monotheism, you know, started, okay, and where good news mm -hmm. comes from. And it's going to be spreading, in my opinion, throughout the rest of the world. I was going to ask you about that LinkedIn article. Are those the main points you, you, you wanted to get across in that article? Well, I, I think the, the, the point is, is really about building long-term relationships rather than quick wins, right? I think that what, what people have to understand about these kinds of historic reconciliations that are in process right now is that you've got to look to the long term. This is not about, well, how are the numbers? Everyone's always asking, well, what are they? And the numbers, by the way, look great. When you take UAE Israel trade, in the last year and a half, it's gone through the roof. It's almost accelerated by a factor of 10. Like around $2 billion yeah. now? Or? And it was mm -hmm. just a couple hundred million, mm -hmm. which wasn't very well publicized when we got started under the cover. Except that that's nothing, right? In other words, I was on a, uh, uh, a TV program for another network where I was asked a, a tough question right after the accords mm -hmm. were signed, which is how much money is really going to be transacted over the next couple of years as a result of the accords. And I thought I went out on a limb and I said, I think about $10 billion. And I remember I got a lot of complaints from some of my team members who thought I was being a little bit aggressive mm -hmm. and too optimistic. I got a call later that evening from my partner in the Gulf, Dr. Sabah al-Banali, who was running our crowd in Arabia, and he says, boss, why were you so conservative? You conservative? I said, what do you mean, Sabah? I said, 10 billion. He goes, no, you know it's going to be 100 billion. And I said, you know, inshallah, mizrat Hashem, God willing, I hope that will occur. And then we, you flash forward a year after the accords, the UAE Minister of Economy, a guy named Abdullah El Touk, uh, was interviewed on Bloomberg in September of last year. And his answer was no. It's not 10, it's not 100, it's going to be a trillion dollars of activity mm -hmm. over the next 10 years. So on that front, things are, are, are great, except that there's elements here that go way beyond the numbers, that go to the heart of what the relationship is. What is the warmth? What is the human contact, the cultural, the spiritual, the, uh, the charitable interaction you know, the education, the, the tourism, the people-to-people -people bonds that are being, uh, and I think on that level, we're, we're just doing spectacular. When you, when you go to the Gulf, you can go into a store and you'll see cherry tomatoes. There'll be a little flag mm -hmm. with an Israeli flag next to it. And you ask yourself, why? Is that to let people know not to buy it? It's the exact opposite. It's to let people know to buy it. Because the storekeeper puts it there yeah. because they know it's Israeli produce and that stuff rocks. It's delicious. Okay, and you're seeing that. You're, you're seeing hundreds of thousands of Israelis flock to the Gulf, okay, and experience those incredible tourist attractions. And they will go to Neom, okay? At some point in the future when, when, when this process moves forward, you'll see Israelis do that and take advantage of the most gorgeous beaches, mm -hmm. you know, in the world, and the most spectacular coral. And it's, it's really, it's infectious and contagious in a good way, because one positive step leads to another positive step. So you're seeing as a result of the Abraham Accords, renewed ties and improvement of ties between Israel and Egypt. Okay, I was just recently in Sharm el-Sheikh, uh, Egypt, which is booming in terms of tourism and what beautiful hotels, and Israelis are, are flocking there, okay? And in terms of Jordan, now we've had peace treaties mm -hmm. with Egypt and Jordan, but they're, they're warming up as a result of this sort of more regional trend. And, and you look, for example, there's a, 
a tripart deal already uh, underway between the UAE, Jordan, and Israel, where the UAE is helping to fund huge solar farms, okay, in, in Jordan, which will then provide, uh, you know, renewable energy, and then Israel building its, you know, world-renowned uh, desalination, mm -hmm. you know, expertise to provide water to a parched Jordan. So you look at this, you know, cooperation in the region, it just, it's heartwarming, it's strategically important. It's one of those few pieces of really good news which everybody from right to left should celebrate and I think has been underhyped. I don't think it's gotten enough coverage, you know, in the mm -hmm. mainstream media. I think people don't understand how big it is and how important it's going to be for the world and, and, and for the region. Yeah. We were just down there in Bahrain in the UAE and uh, some people said certainly the people to people relationship and uh, someone put it this way, cousins getting to know one another. Thank God. Well, you know, it's interesting. In Dubai, there's a very well-known builder named Mohammed Alabar and he was asked for advice to give to Israeli entrepreneurs who wanted to do business with uh, uh, Emiratis. And he said, well, if I had to give you one piece of advice on how to you know, start doing business with me, he would say, when you meet me, ask to meet my mother. And what that means is, I want to build a relationship with mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Don't talk to me about a deal. Yeah. Don't cut right to the chase. Let's, let's learn to get to know each other. Let's take a long-term view. Now, I'm in a business of investing not for a month or three months or a year. When you invest in venture capital in a new semiconductor chip or you're investing in a new form of transportation or a new form of energy or a new way to grow food, this stuff is hard and it takes years mm. to get the technology right and then many more years thereafter to develop the company. Sometimes, you know, we're working on time frames that are three, five, ten years. This is not about, you know, an investment which will, uh, uh, you know, bear fruit usually in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. So I relate to that because mm -hmm. I think that sort of long-term view is what, what is necessary now, not just in terms of building relationships that, that last between neighbors and cousins, but uh, in terms of how we're going to address the problems of the world. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are freaked out and a lot of people are nervous and they see what's going on with the climate and they see what's going on with the economy and the energy shortage and the food shortage and they're, they're pulling their hair out, they're sad. Okay, but the bottom line is that's not gonna do anybody any good. We gotta get up mm -hmm. into the water, be like Nakshon, get up to your neck, okay, in a variety of different ways, whether it's inventing and improving in your own area of activity helping others if you can in terms of charitable work. If you're an investor, invest. If you're an entrepreneur, build companies, create jobs. And altogether, I th I'm very optimistic. I think that you know, the world is coming together mm -hmm. despite setbacks like what's going on in, uh, you know, with the Russian yeah. horrible invasion of the Ukraine, which disturbs me to no end. Uh, but with what, you know, sometimes occasional setbacks I think the world is moving forward. Mm -hmm. And what's going on here in this region with our uh, cousins and brothers across the, uh, the sand, mm -hmm. with, which, without the sand curtain, mm -hmm. is, is really heartening and uh, exciting to me. Yeah. Do you see President Biden's uh, visit here as part of a larger story that's going on here in the region? In Absolutely. The you can't take away the credit that goes to the prior you know, administration mm -hmm. that really put these uh, accords into, into motion, nor can you take away the, the credit that goes to prior, you know, mm -hmm. both Israeli and uh, Arab and, you know, American leaders all the way back, you know, to Camp David and uh, Begin and Sadat. You know, this is the, you know, processes that take decades, yeah. okay? And it's hard for, you know, I'm now at the age where I remember this stuff over 30, 40, 50 years, okay? but. Uh, I think that, you know, you can see trend lines. And what I've, you know, grown to appreciate in my business is not looking next, next week, next month. There are some people who do that very well. They trade, you know, currencies and commodities and, 
good for them. I, I, I invest in stuff that's over the horizon, mm -hmm. okay, trying to look at like where we're going. And I don't think it takes a rocket science brain to look at something like quantum computing, which is going to provide a complete revolution in how we mm -hmm. compute, which is sort of important to a world that's digital. And that's going to be a big thing. I can't tell you exactly when. I can't tell you if that's going to be a five-year time horizon or 10 or 15. But I can tell you with certainty that quantum computing is going to be big. Mm -hmm. Same thing about you know, autonomous driving and the next forms of mobility. If you think that we're going to travel in the same way that we travel now, 10 and 20 years from now, I beg to differ. It's going to be completely different. If you think we're going to grow food the same way that we grow food, you're wrong. Okay, we have a company called Plenty, it's an American company, who are pioneering uh, what's called vertical farming, where they literally grow leafy vegetables and beautiful strawberries and cherry tomatoes inside buildings that can be nine stories high. There's not a human hand touching the produce. They use 95% less water, meaning only 5% of the water normally used to grow this stuff, mm -hmm. and they use 99% less land because it goes up and down, and it's all robotics, and it's competitively priced. This company, uh, Plenty, just did a major deal with Walmart, who's now you know, uh, getting ready to bring this mm -hmm. uh, technology you know, and, the, and, the, and the produce you know, to their customers and their co-investors. So these things are, 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 they sound sort of wild, and they sound like, wow, that's going to be way, way out there. But guess what? It's coming. It's happening. We've all seen it in our lifetimes, right? When you ask somebody, for example, how long ago was the smartphone invented? I think most people say, well, that was like 30 or 40 years ago. Nope. That was 15 years ago. Was, you know, literally a blink in the mm -hmm. eye, you know, we are, we are living in a in time now where the amount of uh, time to create new technology, which affects all of us, has been compressed. Back in the old days, when you invented like electricity, Thomas Edison, okay, or, or Tesla and the others mm -hmm. in that part, it took about, I think it was 80 years or something to get, or 50 years to get everything you know, delivered in terms of the first wave. Mm -hmm. The automobile took a long time to displace everything else, okay? Television took a bunch of time to get into everybody's houses. But today, you get in this TikTok generation, it's moving in the, into your home for good or for bad, mm -hmm. okay, in, in a year. And soon it'll be even shorter. So technology, on the one hand, is affecting us fast, but the big stuff, the stuff like quantum computing or what's going on in space, that will still take, you know, five years, ten mm -hmm. years or more. And that's the kind of stuff normally that, that we're investing in. John, any final thoughts on President Biden's trip here to the region and your thoughts about the future? I think that, you know, we here in, in, in Israel and the region welcome President Biden. You know, it's not simple to get, you know, in a plane come out here in the middle of July and August when it's not particularly uh, 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 cold, it's mm -hmm. nice and hot. I happen to like it. I think many tourists do, and we urge you to come out here. But he's coming out here for a purpose, it sounds like. And the purpose is to deepen Israel's integration into the region. That's exactly a quote of what he said. Mm -hmm. The purpose is to, you know, help the world's energy, you know, problem and, and, and to, you know, push forward this incredibly important Abraham Accords development, which is bringing, you know, a, a, a really the Middle East together and helping the world. And so I, I don't care what party you're in or, you know, what your politics are, that's got to be welcomed and supported and uh, uh, looking forward to seeing good things come out of it. Yeah. So are we. Yeah. John Medved, great to be with you. Thank you.